I'm Dennis Anderson. Julie is off this week as we adjust our show to comply with the mayor's recent COVID-19 declaration. Here's what's coming up now on Almanac North. Minnesota State Auditor Julie Blaha joins us to discuss her office and what it is up to after three years since her start. We'll shed light on how the pandemic is impacting individuals with disabilities in our community. And we'll be joined by in studio by guests to discuss what efforts are needed to help individuals with disabilities get through these trying times. These stories and voices of the region coming up right now on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. Let's begin with the headlines. Well, as of January 12th, Superior Schools have returned to mandated masking. After one week back from the holiday break, 65 students and 20 staff members tested positive for the COVID-19 virus. Now, this measure took effect just two days before Mayor Emily Larson enacted Duluth's 30-day mask mandate, which came into effect today at 5 p.m. The Esmond Building, also known as the Seaway Hotel, caught fire Monday morning in sub-zero temperatures, creating quite the frenzy in Duluth's Lincoln Park Craft District. This is the third time the building has caught fire since Christmas Eve. Some power lines were turned off to support firefighting efforts. Firefighters actually from Superior assisted the Duluth Fire Department. It took nearly seven hours for the large blaze to be put out. A snowmobile struck two-time Bear Grease Marathon winner Ryan Reddington's team while he was training on the Tri-County Corridor Trail in Bayfield County, Wisconsin. That collision left one of Reddington's dogs with a broken leg and in need of surgery. Reddington has filed a police report with the Bayfield County Sheriff's Office. Authorities say there are no suspects at this time. The National Alliance of Mental Illness, also known as NAMI, has set up a wide variety of free online mental health classes. The classes were designed for individuals living with mental health illness, their families, and caregivers. This program offer is going on through February. To learn more, you can visit the NAMI website. And now to our first discussion. With millions of federal dollars coming into the state's treasury, it is Minnesota State Auditor Julie Blaha's job to make sure the Federal CARES Act and ARPA funds are spent wisely. And so here now to tell us more about her office and the important work it does is State Auditor Julie Blaha. And Auditor Blaha, thank you very much for being here on a rather snowy night. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. And again, congratulations on 60 years. That's uh, just amazing. Uh, thank you very kindly. What's the job of the state auditor? Sure. Uh, well, in, in Minnesota, and it is different in every state, in Minnesota, we oversee over $40 billion in local government spending. Now, we do that so we can kind of protect those local decisions that people make. We think that some of the most important work we do is done locally. So our job is to make sure that when neighbors figure something out, what they figure out actually happens. Uh -huh. We do it in three main ways. We have examinations. You hear about these the most, audits, investigations. Uh, we also provide direct support. Everything from training to software for a township. Uh, and then finally, we take all this data that we see, we put it together in reports so that people can make decisions based on facts. So what are you looking for when you audit local government spending? Well, in particular, we are checking standards. First, you know, are you keeping track of things properly? Uh, do you have all of the preventative uh, processes in place so you avoid mistakes in the first place? And then we're double checking to see that you follow through with what you said you were going to do. So a lot of it is, what did you say you were going to do? How did you do it? And did you do it? So how are you notified that perhaps uh, an audit should be conducted on? on a particular government unit? Well, you know, audits in general, those are done annually. Those are things that are, I think a lot of people assume that audits are punitive. You know, most people are thinking of right. an IRS personal right. audit, very sure. different. Uh, and audits are not punitive. They're not even primarily investigative. They're preventative. The goal is to make sure you've got everything in place to avoid problems. Now, if something does go wrong though, um, and uh, we need to, find, to fix something, we may go do an investigation. And to start investigations, those are typically started with a tip. 
You know, a lot of people are required mm -hmm. to tell us when they see a problem. Right. And a lot of times it's citizens simply calling us up saying, hey, I'm concerned about this, will you take a look? So who sets the accounting standards for local government units? Well, in, in, uh, in the United States, Minnesota, we follow national standards. So these are the government um, uh, board of accountancy, they, uh, uh, board of uh, auditing stand, of accounting standards, excuse me. Uh, you, you might not be shocked that we can get a little stuck yeah. in the acronyms <laughs> in my office, but it, these are national standards. And then our job is to apply those. Though in our state, when something is specific to Minnesota, then we can also help develop more specific standards as so well. So here in Minnesota, are all government units eventually audited? No, you know, what you, what you have are most government units um, are operating at a large enough level that they need to be audited. Um, you know, a lot of smaller townships, they may not be fully audited, but have other checks that happen every couple of years. But all of the counties, most cities, are having some sort of financial uh, examination every single year. Can local residents request an audit of their town? You certainly could, you know, and uh, we sometimes get requests from residents. Sometimes we get requests from boards, you know, uh, local elected officials. And we could come in and take a, spe a special look. Right now, we already audit over 200 local gover government entities. And then we, a lot of times, check the audits of uh, entities that use a private firm as well. So if a per person has a concern about possible misuse of funds mm -hmm. someplace, what do they do? Just call your office and say, please look into this? Well, yeah, start out by simply type, going on the internet, typing in OSA Minnesota. And you're going to come to our site uh, and then pop in that you want to tell us what, what you're seeing. Uh, and sometimes you can call in and we can very quickly answer your question. Uh, other times we'll take your information and do a more detailed investigation. Um, on average, though, uh, Minnesota, we're pretty lucky that we're a good government state. <laughs> you know, we don't have... Uh, the same level, I think, of issues that many other states have, uh, which is great for us in Minnesota. Uh, but we're always ready to take a look when people have a concern. Well, I want to thank you very much for being here. Time goes very quickly once we're on the air. You bet. And uh, it was wonderful talking with you, Auditor, and uh, we appreciate you coming up here on a very snowy night. You bet. I can't wait to come back. All right. Julie Blaha, Minnesota State Auditor. Thank you very kindly. Thank you. You bet. It's time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from an area journalist about the stories they are covering. Our guest today is Marshall Helmberger, the publisher of The Timber Jay. So we're reporting on Greenwood Township's decision to install equipment to treat well water at the town hall there. Uh, last year, one of the town board members had insisted on getting the well water at the hall tested, and those tests came back showing levels of arsenic several times the established drinking water limit. Now, arsenic is not that uncommon up here uh, since it occurs naturally in the glacial till. Um, it's something that most well owners in the area aren't testing for, however, and, uh, but that num the number of people testing has actually increased since our story uh, appeared on the high levels at the Greenwood Hall. Uh, the arsenic level at the town hall was a, a bigger issue than it might have been uh, because the hall is located less than a mile from Lake Vermilion and many cabin owners on the lake don't have their own wells and regularly use the outside spigot at the town hall as a convenient source for drinking water. That practice ended abruptly once the water test revealed the problem. But perhaps uh, seasonal residents will be able to start using that water again in the future if the new treatment process uh, that the township is planning to install proves effective. Uh, the new system will cost about $7,000 to install and will also treat the water for excess iron and manganese, which are two other metals that are commonly found in water up here. An interesting side note is that high arsenic levels in well water near the new campground at the Lake Vermilion State Park uh, forced the DNR to abandon its plans a few years ago to use well water to serve campground guests there. Instead, they installed a state-of-the-art lake water treatment uh, system to serve the campground, which was much more expensive than had they been able to just use well water.
And we're also reporting on a new study by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the DNR that documents the period of ice coverage on Minnesota lakes, which has shortened over the past 50 years by as much as three weeks in some cases. On average across the state, the period from the start of ice coverage to ice out has decreased by about 10 to 14 days uh, since the late 1960s as a result of climate change. It's even more than that for Lake Vermilion, where the average period of ice coverage has dropped from about 165 days in the late 1960s to just 142 days currently. About two thirds of that increase comes from later ice in dates. And this isn't a surprise to folks who've lived in our area. Milder falls um, have definitely become a consistent pattern in our region in recent years. And that means that lakes are freezing up considerably later than they used to. Uh, ice out dates are also coming earlier, but only about four to five days earlier in most cases. While some folks are probably pleased with the change, it's definitely impacting winter recreation in the, in the region, particularly ice fishing and snowmobiling. And there's no reason to believe that this trend won't continue. In other words, that our ice uh, duration will continue to decrease. Uh, the warming climate is also affecting lakes in the summer, according to the study, which found that the average July, August surface temperature on Minnesota lakes has increased three to 3.9 degrees on average. That has serious ramifications for natural lake habitats. We're also reporting on a plan by a group of three Twin Cities entrepreneurs who recently purchased the Long Branch Saloon located on Fall Lake in Winton. The three partners call themselves the Travail Collective, and they've been remarkably successful in recent years in opening and operating unique restaurants in the Twin Cities area. At a recent meeting in Ely, they outlined their plans to have food service at the saloon beginning this spring, and they have plans to develop significant lodging opportunities on the surrounding property, starting with RVs and eventually converting to small cabins to house guests. They're also envisioning an event center as part of the project. Now, the site has about 900 feet of shoreline on Fall Lake, which offers a direct connection to the boundary water. So it's a very popular location. It's a beautiful site. I'm sure it'll be uh, very popular. Uh, though they will need to upgrade some of the infrastructure there, however, uh, including connecting the property to municipal sewer and water. And they'll be looking for help from the Department of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation uh, for some of those improvements. It, it certainly has the potential to be one of the biggest developments, well, the biggest development project in Winton in decades and could be a real attraction for visitors to the community. Uh, for folks who haven't heard of Winton, it's a tiny former sawmill town located about four miles east of Ely. The current workforce crisis is impacting many people here in the Twin Ports. Individuals with disabilities are facing particular challenges. Almanac North producer Megan McGarvey spoke with the executive director of ARC Northland, a state representative and an impacted individual about their firsthand experiences. Before the pandemic, we had about a 10,000 uh, open positions in the state of Minnesota in, with home and community-based services. So that's people that are receiving services in group homes and in vocational services and then others as well. Individuals depend on these services. There are dire consequences for individuals if they can't get access to caring professions. They may have to go to the hospital or a nursing home. They may lose their job. They're dependent on individuals for their activities of daily living. And they depend on that to maintain independent, um, productive lives. When the pandemic first started, we didn't really get to see family or fr friends like we usually re were able to. So that was really hard. I couldn't work for six months, so I couldn't see my friends and coworkers. Um, 
we had to FaceTime a lot. So it definitely changed. Vocational providers, they had to just shut down. And then they had to try to rebuild. I mean, they had to furlough staff, and then now they're trying to get staff back, and, and it's not easy to do. We've made a priority this last few years to make sure we're taking care of the most vulnerable populations in our state. And so we were fortunate to get significant amounts of federal funding through the Biden administration. And this funding is geared for home and community-based services. So we were able to invest significant amounts of money over $650 million last year to bolster home and community-based services. And part of what had to happen was to make sure we could provide um, direct support services for people with disabilities. Um, we need to make sure that we could r raise wages because wages had been so depressed in this sector for so long. And so we were able to successfully raise the wage to $15 an hour because that costs hundreds of millions of dollars and it's permanent. So that's a permanent cost to the state. And now we need to figure out besides increasing the wage, what other benefits are of value to the caring profession? And I think services like childcare, um, tuition benefits, um, really good health and medical benefits, paid time off. So what other things can we add to attract people to these professions? And I think those are what are really, people are asking for those types of benefits. There's challenges now with people that may be vaccinated and whatnot, but they're getting, they're still getting a breakthrough or they can't go to work. I really wish there was like more tra transportation for people with disabilities. Um, especially in Duluth, there's only like one or two adaptive buses or cab companies. Because when I try and call stride, sometimes they're sometimes fault and sometimes we have limited staff, so it is hard to get places sometimes. So when I hear my constituents asking for a, a tax cut or return of some of this additional revenue, I know that we have so many more needs uh, that we are not meeting. And I have so many uses for that funds that um, I hope people of Minnesota understand that we are not meeting the needs of everyone. And I think we're seeing that during the COVID crisis. But for this community, it's definitely going to be looking at benefits and wages for direct support professionals and working with providers to make sure that they can offer services. And right now they're asking for emergency assistance because they have staffing crises. They are not able to fill positions or they have people out with, who are sick with COVID. And so they have a real uh, need right now for, for workers. If we had more staff, it wouldn't be so difficult. ARC Northland lists a number of resources for individuals with disabilities on its website. As the pandemic continues, there's a real concern about long-term impacts on this community of great value. Joining us now is John Nelson, who serves as Executive Director of Residential Services, Inc., or RSI, in northeastern Minnesota. RSI serves adults, children, and families with both physical and cognitive barriers. Also joining us is Terry McCabe, who is the Vision Director for Home and Community-Based Services at St. Louis County. I want to thank you both for being with us. Welcome again on this very snowy Friday night, so good to have you with us. John, what is the job of RSI? What do you do? So RSI is a, a nonprofit that's based here in Duluth, um, started services in 1978, and we support people with disabilities to live their best life in the community. So we're um, supporting people in group homes, but we're also supporting people in their own homes, providing help with activities of daily living, as uh, Representative Schultz mm -hmm. described, um, helping them work, um, and just helping them participate in the community. How, if at all, has the pandemic affected people with disabilities? 
Um, it's been a, a terrible impact on people with disabilities. Um, organizations like RSI right now in the state of Minnesota are averaging a 30% vacancy rate in positions. That means 30% of our workforce isn't there. So wow. we're, we're spread that thin and trying to support people. And uh, programs like RSI all around the state are having to close homes, are having to ask parents to take people home. And, um, and, and we're hitting the point where people are losing services and not really having a place to go. Wow, some big changes because of the pandemic. Absolutely. So Terry, uh, you're, you're the supervisor, I believe, of aging and adult disabilities and Minnesota uh, Choices Assessment for the northern part of St. Louis County based out of Virginia. What does that entail? What do you do? Um, so our, our job in home and community-based services is to assess people for eligibility um, for services in the community and then to try to connect them with those services in the community. Mm -hmm. John, what types of services then are offered to people with disabilities? Well, um, pretty much anything you can imagine. So when, when county case managers who work for Terry contact us, they might be looking for somebody who's living in their own apartment and just need help with some financial assistance or it could be meal preparation or meal planning. Um, um, but it also could be somebody who's got extreme and complicated needs with um, uh, physical needs, medical needs. So they're going to need 24-hour supervision, somebody helping with every single um, activity of daily living. So it really is a, a wide spectrum of services. Mm -hmm. Terry, what kind of housing availabilities are there in St. Louis County for people who need housing? So interesting statistic for you. Um, on our coordinated entry housing um, wait list, we have 73% of the people on that list have um, a disability of long-term duration. And disability can be a physical disability, mental health, mm -hmm. um, developmental disability. So um, that's one aspect of homelessness. I think the other aspect that um, John and I probably see most often is people who um, are perhaps living in a, a group home, for example, and um, aren't able to stay there anymore. There's not a place for them to go to. Um, people living in the community too, their needs might become too great for their family. It's hard to find a place mm -hmm. for them to go to. Are there a number of group homes in St. Louis County or not necessarily? Yes. There are? Yes. Uh -huh. We have um, approximately 1,159 um, adult foster care beds. Um, and then, you know, we also have customized living, also known as assisted living, um, long-term care facilities like nursing facilities. Do you try to have people with disabilities remain in their own homes if they can? Yes. How, how do you work on that? Yes, that's, that's the goal of home and community-based services is to allow for that choice um, so that people can remain in their own homes, in their own communities with the services that they need mm -hmm. to support them living in the, the most integrated setting possible. John, who qualifies for uh, outpatient services, outpatient counseling? Well, it really comes down to um, the level of need and, and, and if the person's able to um, you know, care for themselves, you know, over, you know, most of the time and just need to have outpatient. The folks, most of the folks we're supporting are on Medicaid. And so, um, as, as, as Terry described, they're getting an assessment to determine what level of services they get. And, and right now, the, the challenge is, is whether you need just a few services or you need um, a lot of services, you're being impacted by this because you could be living in your own apartment, have a job, and right now, you might not have a staff person who's going to show up to help get you out of bed or help you make the meal or help you get show with showering or dressed. And those are the things that we're talking about uh -huh. is that those are the folks that we just don't have who can get out there yeah. and um, continue to support people. We've been talking about adults. Is there also support for children? Absolutely. RSI operates some um, three um, foster care homes in, in St. Louis County with for children, and it's... Um, um, just as dramatic and just as difficult. A lot of the kids who are placed out of the home are kids with very complex needs, either behavioral needs or medical needs. Very challenging kids, and it's hard to find people who, who want to work with that level of need in a good economy. And right now, it's almost impossible to find people that want to work mm -hmm. with that difficult of a population. Are most people, maybe you can both address this, are most people with disabilities in their own homes or not really? I think uh, the vast majority are in their own homes. They are. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So at, at what point then might they need some uh, residential help uh, other than their own home, some in-service help? 
Well, I can tell you from our experience, it comes down to, um, you know, do they need help with, you know, are they putting themselves at risk with some of the decisions or the, some of the I things see. they can't do for themselves? So if, if they're at risk of, of, of that, where they can't eat, you know, eat healthily or stay healthy, make good decisions, then that's usually when you're looking at 24-hour um, supports. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry, how does the county respond? Does somebody uh, maybe make a phone call to you or something and uh, say that uh, I, have, uh, I have somebody here that really needs some assistance from the county? How do you mm -hmm. respond to that? Sure. Um, so we get those calls every day. You do? Um, yes, yes. People call in and um, in order to qualify for Men Choice or for home and community based services, yeah. that's where the Men Choices assessment comes in, where we assess what needs do you have. And then we match you with the services to address those needs. And that is open to anybody in um, the state, regardless of income. Okay. Boy, our time is up already. Uh, time just flies, I know, and around the air. John Nelson, Terry McCabe. We really want to thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for explaining what RSI is all about. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it very much. Well, that's our time for now, but you can keep up with our latest updates by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter, or visit the WDSC website for program updates and more information about the station. And download the PBS video app for on-demand viewing of Almanac North and your favorite PBS programs. Now, here at the station, we wish you all good health I'm Dennis Anderson. Good night, everybody, and be kind.